I want to introduce uh, Nidhi Rastogi. Um, Nidhi uh, presented us uh, with a uh, paper that at first glance, we weren't really sure uh, what this was, right? It was kind of like, oh, what is, like, is this going to be good? Is this not going to be good? And um, I, I, I was like, let's give it a chance to see, you know, let's see what would happen. We walk through it, and if you're an exploit developer, if you are somebody that's really interested in finding bugs and vulnerabilities, um, and you're looking for a new avenue to do this, I think the research you're about to see is super interesting. Uh, it's taking some machine learning um, algorithms and applying it to source code to find bugs. And when I heard that, I was like, yeah, that's gonna be really interesting to a bunch of folks. So if you, uh, so so Needy actually um, uh, put this together and even provided us with source code. Uh, so she may ask you if you want to follow along, you can actually bring up your machine and actually download some source code in the whole thing. All right. So without further ado, uh, Needy, are you there? Um, yes, I am. Are you advancing the slide a bunch? <laughs> I want to do that because uh, I kind of made the slides a bit more presentation friendly. So I'd like to share my screen, if that's all right. Uh, I don't think uh, that we can, uh, I, I think it's on a different person's I, machine. I think that I can make this work. Just give me one moment here. Okay. All right. All right, mm -hmm. yeah, we're just learning on the fly. We see it. We see them. There oh, there we go. Yay. <laughs> I just have all right. And that's how you use PowerPoint, everybody. We can all leave now. Okay. <laughs> all right, Didi. All right. I'll, I'll let you go. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. And thank you, Emily. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. I'm Didi Rastogi, and I'm a researcher at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where I work um, at the intersection of a bunch of cool sounding uh, technologies. Uh, it's AI, cybersecurity, networks, uh, patient health data analytics, and, and a few others. So where did the last one pop up? Because I'm interested in privacy and security of user data. And what a better um, application than, uh, than patient, uh, patient health data. So, but today I'll be presenting a tutorial on using deep learning to detect uh, software vulnerabilities. I wish I can pronounce the last word vulnerabilities uh, <laughs> accurately every single time. But if not, I hope you guys understand. That's what this talk is about, about detecting software vulnerabilities using deep learning. So the thing is, what do you do with that information? It depends on the audience. And I was told that this audience um, you know, has a mind of their own. So I'm not going to bother myself with that. I'm just going to share the tools with you and then you decide what you do with it. So whether you indulge in some adversarial activity, show off your ninja skills and uh, catch bugs before anyone else or even zero day uh, vulnerabilities, this skill will help you get started. I won't say it'll make you an expert um, and it will get you started in that direction. Um, that, that, that's something I can guarantee today. And uh, in this talk, you'll kind of get a 1000 feet a uh, view of how deep learning models work. And at the end of it, you'll have a code to play with. So do check out the GitHub link uh, that I provided in my slides. So why software vulnerabilities? Why is it even important? We, we've been hearing about it uh, year after year because um, there's an increasing number, there, were, there have always been an increasing number of software vulnerabilities uh, that have been discovered year after year whether they're reported publicly um, or discovered internally in proprietary code. So these software bugs or vulnerabilities um, can pose serious risk of exploit and result in uh, system compromise, information leak, denial of service, to name a few. And despite the fact that numerous approaches have been uh, proposed for, for this kind of a detection of uh, in programs or in code, um, uh, there's been an increasing number reported, uh, especially if you go and check annual uh, compilation of the number of bugs that have been reported on, uh, uh, on the common vulnerabilities and exposures website, uh, you'll see an increase in this chart kind of proves that. 
I could only find one until 2018 where somebody compiled it. Um, so I'm just using somebody else, somebody else's work. Uh, and for those who don't know what I'm talking about, um, CVE is uh, what, it, what is short for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposure. It's essentially um, a list of entries and each entry contains uh, an identification number, a description, and um, some public reference for uh, publicly known cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Um, and the CVE list or the website is managed um, and monitored by the MITRE Corporation. So, so that's just some extra information in case you end up looking up uh, after the talk. So, so to address these uh, increasing number of uh, software bugs that uh, adversaries can take advantage of, um, and we also want to look beyond uh, the static and dynamic analysis tools that uh, many of us have uh, already heard of, used over you know, year after year. Um, there has been a significant, significant work over the past many years um, in the usage of uh, machine learning um, for program analyses. And uh, what they're able to show is, uh, you know, <clears throat> what they're able to show using machine learning is, um, you know, where is, uh, if, if a program is vulnerable or not. It, it, and there are other kind of analysis which can be done using machine learning. Um, and how has that become possible uh, is because there is big data. Big data has exploded even in the security space. So there is an availability of a large amount of open source code, uh, which opens up the opportunity to learn the patterns of software vulnerabilities um, directly from the mind data. So um, yes, machine learning modeling has been helpful, but it has also um, become possible because of the availability of uh, so much of data uh, that, uh, that analysts and scientists and researchers are able to apply machine learning models to them. Um, but that comes with a lot of uh, limitations, like any tool, um, with time, we will start, we'll start seeing their limitations and so has come with machine learning. Um, so what happens when you're using machine learning model is that you need to engage a security expert in the process uh, who has to define the vulnerability features. Um, and uh, which essentially what, what the feature is, is that it essentially is um, an individual measure or a property or attribute or characteristics, it's known by different names. Um, it, it is something that is observed, uh, a phenomenon which is observed, like in our case, uh, in the software case, if you're evaluating a code, then uh, we will have features, some, some trivial features like function length, uh, nesting depth, et cetera, and some non-trivial features like suffix trees and so on and so forth, and even n-grants. So um, how does one know that um, through experience, um, such as, you know, um, if we were to talk about one of the vulnerability uh, or a vulnerable function, um, something uh, it will, it, it more often than not will have uh, a complex pointer, arithmetic, um, as well as some uh, complex and highly nested control structures. So things along those lines. And what this means is that uh, a vulnerable function is likely to have um, a wide variety of special characters. So I'm just explaining one use case. Um, so, so, so that vulnerable function will have a wide variety of special characters, which will lead to both high entropy and high character diversity, which, which, which basically means there, will, there is a high, um, there will be a lot of pointers. Um, so for those who don't have a machine learning background, I figure it's important that I give an analogy um, that we click with you so that uh, when we move forward with uh, the more, uh, you know, with, with the slides, you're able to connect, you're able to associate uh, modeling using machine learning or even deep learning uh, even better. So as an analogy and to help you understand what feature means, um, let's look at, uh, consider there is a machine learning model, uh, just a model, like a black box. It's tasked with classifying individual images and uh, like you see a bunch of images here, uh, there are a bunch of animals, and then there is a, uh, you know, a frog, 
and whatnot. So that machine learning model is tasked with classifying individual images as cats or others, whatever the rest is, from a huge data set of images. And huge is key here. Um, and to do that, um, the analyst of the machine learning model operator, they need to supplement the model with the attributes it needs to consider in order to perform this binary classification so, so that there's a uniform approach across every image. So there has to be feature description, uh, like in this case, uh, if, if I were to uh, classify it, that an image belongs to a, to a cat. So some of these features are ears, color of, the, um, of that uh, thing, uh, the shape of that thing, the eye shape, eye color, uh, even the fact that they have eyes. All of these become part of the features. I've listed just some very obvious ones. So the, the model requires some kind of features as well as data. So features and image data set, they're fed into the cat classifier, machine learning model. And believe me, there are classifiers which do that, uh, plenty of them, because uh, images are very easy to find. Um, and uh, it's, it's an easy data set to work with. Uh, easily available data set. I wouldn't say it's easy to work with. So as a result of this, uh, in the most simplest form, um, the model will spit out uh, images, classifying them as cats or those that are not with some accuracy. So that's what the machine learning model would do, um, uh, a, a binary classifier. So there are plenty of machine learning models, but we're only talking about a very simple model. So this will be able to tell you with accuracy that 70% of the cats um, uh, Seventy percent of the images are cats, and the rest are others. So, imagine doing this for software, and uh, which is even more labor-intensive and requires uh, um, security expert intervention and guidance, which can get very time-consuming. Obviously, depending on their availability and their expertise, and all of that can add up to the cost. And it's it's not sustainable. It's not scalable. So. It can also result in very high false positives and negative rates, which means that some of the features may be wrongly labeled as essential attributes or even wrongly labeled as causing vulnerability. Um, that, uh, just what I described in, the, in, in a couple of slides ago. So, um, so, so how the feature has been chosen, how the feature has been described and how the entire data uh, object has been labeled can very much determine how the machine learning model behaves. So that is, as we have come to learn, is the biggest limitation of, of using machine learning. So we need to find ways to get over those limitations. And not only, well, not only getting over those limitations, but also not having to define features is one of the areas where the deep learning approach have an edge over machine learning. So using machine learning models, features can be automatically discovered. That is the biggest advantage, advantage of using deep learning because it acts like a black box. You just feed in data in a certain format so that the model can understand that uh, data and then it spits out um, and then it spits out things um, the way the model is supposed to behave without you having to really worry about, oh, how do I tune it? What kind of features would the, would the model uh, work with? So that aspect of machine learning is done away with in, in deep learning. So this, uh, this feature of deep learning allows us to alleviate uh, or to minimize the engagement of uh, human or security expert on, on vulnerabilities, as well as helps us provide more effective systems or uh, in other words, helps us uh, not engage, not let any security expert know what we are trying to do. Um, just prepare our bunch of code, feed it into the model and the code and the model will tell you which part is vulnerable and which part is clean. So that's what we are going to see in the next few slides. So now that we have uh, developed some sort of intuition about, about uh, what we are getting into, let's get into the theory of using deep learning model to detect software uh, vulnerabilities, because otherwise you will not understand. It will probably be just a three slide presentation if, if you don't really understand what model are we using, how to use that data, what, what data are we using, how do we work with that data and so on and so forth. So, and, and to get a bit more focused, 
I do want to mention that uh, we won't be talking about all kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, that this is a great uh, future work. But uh, for today, we will be focusing on two of these, um, detecting buffer overflows and resource management errors. Both of, been, both of them have a category in CVE. Um, and so we were also able to gather um, data from the CVE website. Um, uh, and also we will be discuss, I'll be reviewing uh, what, um, what is the deep learning model based on. Um, and that uh, model is called the bi-directional LSTM model. Uh, LSTM stands for long short term memory. I'll be describing how the model works and why did we choose this one over the others um, so that we can appreciate um, you know, the, the uses of different models. So, Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so let's first talk about uh, what the modeling entails, the deep learning modeling and modeling entails. Um, this this deep learning model or the bidirectional LSTM model uh, entails some of the steps that I'm going to talk you through, uh, talk through one by one. Uh, but first, let's let let me give you an overview of what these are. So the first one is to prepare the data, which in our case is the source code. Um, and, 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 and this one was focused only on C, C++ source code. Um, the next step is uh, to choose the appropriate neural network, which will perform the deep learning. Um, that's just, these are just interchangeable terminologies to use in case somebody is wondering. Um, and, the, uh, and, and in our case, uh, this neural network or the deep learning model is the, uh, is the binary LSTM model. This is followed by actually running the model using the data and then uh, gathering results followed by analyzing them. So this is what we're going to be uh, learning in the couple of, next couple of slides. Okay, so data preparation, that's extremely important. Um, before you feed anything to the model or, or any model, uh, you need to prepare the data in such a way that the model can understand and work with it. So let's first talk about that. Um, in this step, um, we need to understand that deep learning model will not accept the code as is, and it has to it has to accept it in a form and in, in, in the level of granularity that it will understand. And because what we want is that uh, if we give the deep learning model some code, it is able to tell us point us that this section of the code is vulnerable or is it clean. So for that, uh, we do need to do some work. And uh, what that entails is that uh, first step is to transform the C, C++ code into an intermediate representation. So there's a code and then there's a model in between. There are a couple of sub steps. Um, the first step is to break down the code into smaller parts in such a way that, uh, that, that the lines of codes which are put together, they have some form of semantic relationship between the program elements, such as uh, the data dependency is there and the control dependency is there. It shouldn't be like a variable, variable was described and then, and then never used in the rest of the lines of codes. So, so those, that, those chunk of codes need to be prepared. Um, and there are software tools out there which do that with, with, with good enough accuracy um, but, but this is a step you need to be aware of. So assume that you have those chunk of codes ready. And then, um, yeah, so that's, that's what needs to be done. And the next step is to cre create uh, vector embeddings of those line of codes, and I'll get there. But before that, I wanted to give you a big picture of the data preparation. Um, so we have the C, C++ code, which you have broken down into smaller chunk of codes, which are semantically linked. Uh, those linked, uh, those, those uh, semantically linked line of codes are called code, ga code gadgets. You can call them anything else. It's, uh, there's nothing technical about this term. Um, this is just uh, what the researcher who, who, who did uh, work on this, that's what they call it. You can call it whatever you want. And then once you have individual line of codes, which are part of a code gadget, um, each line of code is tokenized, and then it is converted into a vector embedding. You don't have to worry about what am I talking about. 
there are a bunch of tools out there which will do each individual of all of these steps individually um so vectorizing uh, vector embedding of each token like even a semicolon or a or a bracket or or something like string copy all of these commands individual ones not i'm not talking about at character level at word level and at string level um they are all converted into a vector using the word to vec uh, algorithm it's a very popular algorithm um and you can easily access it online people across the world use it uh, for for different uh, modeling purposes um and then next the next step is to choose an appropriate neural network model so we have the data ready ready to be fed in the model but you can't just uh, feed that into any model and expect uh, uh, relevant results you can try it and then you will find out for yourself uh, which model is is good the the code as such is ready to be fed into any deep learning model so we um uh the researchers actually went ahead and used the bidirectional lstm model and i'm going to explain you why did they choose this specific model first it's because number one it's a supervised model the what supervised model means is that uh, there is a vector embedding which we don't know what features were used there's just a vector embedding I'll, and i'll show you in uh, this upcoming slides what the vector embedding looks like each vector embedding is corresponding to the lines of codes so there's a line of code which is directly mapped to one vector embedding and then there is a label right next to it so imagine three columns one is the lines of code um the code gadget next is the vector embedding uh and the third one is a label which tells you whether that whether those bunch of lines of code is there any vulnerability in that or not so all this is required to train so that when you feed in you know um and other uh, slices of code later on you know in the future like um so you need to still train the model so that the model understands the behavior of vulnerabilities therefore each vulnerability needs to be trained separately according to this approach i'm not saying that's going to be the only approach but that that's uh, that's 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 going to be uh, excellent if you are able to just feed in any code and just the code will tell us what vulnerability it is that will be a multi classifier we are talking about a binary classifier which will tell us vulnerable code vulnerable code or clean code so we have all these uh, so 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 that's what the advantage of using a supervised model is um you can tell you can tell the model uh, this is what the vulnerability will look like and then you can also tag your entire data and divide it into test and train sets uh even when you are testing you already know what the value of that label is but you can always test it um using the model and then the model will tell you how close um were your predicted values versus the actual values so so that's essentially how um um we we do analyses for all these models but I, but but we'll talk about that later okay so uh we talked about the supervised model and then also um the lines of code that i just talked about as vulnerable vulnerable or not um because the problem that we are dealing with is to identify vulnerability in programs programming is uh, logic in sequence it's it's all done sequentially uh, so that's why those lines of code have to be semantically linked so that that effort is required for for training um so so and the by by directional lst model is excellent when there is a logic uh sequential logic to the input which let's just check mark for now that yes there exists um and and i also want to explain a little more about the model what is bidirectional mean what if it was not bidirectional it was just lstm because that is also a model um so lstm which is called long short term memory uh what it does is it preserves information from inputs or the vector embeddings of the lines of codes so the input becomes the vector embeddings and what happens is that um when that is fed into the model um those embeddings are saved in a hidden state while you're also passing future information so 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 let's get, let me show you a diagram 
so that you can understand. So this is bi-directional. You are feeding in data. It is coming in forward direction, and then there is a backward direction. So that's what bi-direction means. There's a forward direction, there's a bi-direction. And then there are inputs. These inputs are the vector embeddings, as well as the hidden state of the previous vector embedding. So if I'm going um, a backward and a forward uh, pass on LSTM, so the backward will contain the input as well as a hidden input, a hidden layer it's called, a hidden layer from the previous input. So there are two inputs going into the backward and the forward form. So if I were to give you a more, um, uh, let's say, bookish uh, uh, explanation of um, using bidirectional. So you need to run your input, which is a line of course or, or vector embeddings in two ways, one from the past to the future, and then from the future to the past. And what differs this approach from uh, unidirectional or LSTM is that it runs backwards. Um, so that it runs backwards, you preserve information from the future. And when you run it in, in when, when you run it, I'm, I'm trying to explain. So I'm just gonna tell you how this applies to our code and, and then we'll be done with it. So how this applies to our code is that uh, semantically, our code is semantically linked um, and it is copied and made part of the code gadget. So we have uh, a semantically linked bunch of code in the code gadget. Uh, so this semantic includes data and control dependency, which is encoded in the input, right? Remember the vector embeddings in both the direction. Uh, so that fully captures the behavior of the input code. So a code which is logical in, in sequence, uh, backward and forward, there will be a logic to it. So that's how the BLSTM will be perfect for this kind of uh, input. Okay, I need a breather. Okay, so now let's talk about how do we run binary LSTM neural network model is uh, we input the code gadgets, we model the binary, uh, we use the, the model uh, binary LSTM. And what the, the code does is that it takes the input and it randomly divides the code or the, or the vectors into 75 to 80% of vector embeddings, which is used for training. So now the so the training is basically understanding the behavior of vulnerabilities. Um, and then we test that on separate code, which has not been identified as vulnerable or clean. So that's what the modeling does. And as the output, what, what we get is that we get um, a map to the vector embeddings, which tells us, uh, or the labeling of the vector embeddings, which tells us whether that specific vector embedding is it vulnerable or not vulnerable? You should have a separate mapping of the vector embedding in the lines of code so that you can reverse map it to, oh, this vector embedding, it's saying it's vulnerable. What is it associated? What is the line of code that is associated with? And then you can look, at, look back to the original C, C++ code. So that's how we are preserving provenance of uh, these vector embeddings. And, and that's how these, these models are essentially helpful. So let's look at, and then we analyze the results. There are a bunch of um, terminologies used. We won't be using all of them because they need to apply to our results or what kind of analyses we want to do. I just put this here uh, for completion, for completeness sake. Uh, but let's dive into the experiments because I've almost crossed my duration of time. Uh, so the experiments, uh, we prepared the data. Um, Two data sets are available in the GitHub code. One is on buffer error vulnerability and the other one on, is on resource management. They both have open source software programs associated with them because that's where the line of, that's where the C++, C++ code was extracted from. Um, you don't have to go look anywhere, it's all there. Um, but um, since we didn't talk about how the code gadgets were created, um, there, there, are, there are tools out there which were used and then there was, a, there was a lot of tuning required to make them available. So I, I admit there was some manual labor required there. Uh, but let's just talk about the number of code gadgets that were used, um, or the group of lines of codes that we used. Uh, for 119, CV 119, there's some 40,000. And for the resource management, there were 22,000. Um, so they're just ready to use. And these are just the steps, really just a handful of steps which are required to prepare your environment to, and to help you get go with the code. Uh, you do need 
So TensorFlow is something which is absolutely necessary. Uh, the libraries will help you run your deep learning code. And then uh, each deep learning model has a set of parameters. Um, these parameters, you can play with them and then kind of see how the results show up. Um, so, so this um, is essentially how code gadget looks like. You'll notice here, um, the, these were all put together in, in the zero. Uh, so this is one code gadget all in one file, CW119. Uh, this code gadget uh, or, or the file which has a bunch of code gadgets, there are about 38,000 code gadgets. Um, so these are just a couple of lines. These are the name of the files that were used. Um, and zero, zero basically here means that, uh, um, that this was a clean code. The, the places where it is a, a vulnerable code, it says one. So that's, when you look at, the, at these files, you'll, you'll understand. And then once you run the Python code, um, the, the training set. So there is a reason I can't show the, uh, the slide is because it takes quite a lot of time for the, uh, for the deep learning model to run. And uh, that wasn't possible. If I were to speed, speed it up, even then, you wouldn't have understood anything. So I prefer to show you screenshots. So once you run this command, um, the, the model is trained. And what you see here, these are the vectors I was talking about all this time, uh, the vector embeddings. And right next to it, val is actually the label. Uh, zero, zero basically means this was clean code. So we don't find those many vulnerabilities. They're only hidden here and there. Um, but there were plenty of uh, them. And then there was some skewing occurring where the, the one case is the vulnerability um, that were detected, they, they were far and few. So there was, some, um, there was some work which required to be done in terms of weighing the, 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 the labels. So, so that's, that's kind of out of scope from this talk. And then when you run the code um, for the prediction, uh, again, there is a separate prediction code and then there's a test data set um, and then there's, this is the model which contained, uh, which contained the training data set. And this one kind of captures the entire behavior of, uh, of the, the vulnerable and the clean code. So all of that is here. And when you run the code, what you see is again, vectors. You don't see code, you only see vectors because if we are dealing with vectors and vectors in, vectors out. So we have the vectors and then the values. So some of them will show you that they're vulnerable. Okay, next one, the analysis how you do the analysis is kind of compare the true values with the predicted values and just add them up and uh, that uh, we see uh, analyses in different uh, forms. So false positive rate, which is a measure of accuracy for the model, it reports positive inaccuracies and then false negative inaccuracies, um, false, sorry, false negative rate, which reports the neg negative inaccuracies precision it, 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 it says um, the number of correct results um, divided by the number of all results. And then there's, a, there's an F1 score. It, 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 comes to consider, it kind of considers both precision and recall to compute the score. And so it's kind of a measure of uh, a model's accuracy. So the higher the F1 in precision, the lower are the false positive and false negative rates and higher is the true positive rate. So they are all kind of interlinked because the formula, um, that's how it works. So that brings us to the end of the talk and I'm open to questions. Should I stop sharing my screen now? Or? Uh, no, you can, you can leave that up. Uh, Nidhi, let's see. Um, so Dan, there was a few questions here actually. So I, I guess uh, I'll go through some of them. So uh, Dan Gavin asked if you knew any tools or if you had an idea for some of the tools that are used for vectorizing the tokens and creating the code gadgets themselves. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the vectorization, like I said, uh, is done through what to vec You can look it up online right now. It's uh, easily available. Uh, the code gadget is done through, um, I, I forget the map, it's something, I can, I can tell you the name later on. Uh, but it's sure. uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's a paid tool, but you can quickly use it and then, you know, use it within your uh, free subscription uh, time frame, like uh, 30 days. Just create, quickly create it. I'm sorry, I think it's Checker Max, something like that. It's, it's 
Something yeah, and like if you if you remember the tool, you can always stick it in your um, hallway like channel in Slack yeah. Yeah. another time. But yeah, so, good question. Uh, there was another question here that came in, and I think you did answer it. Like, uh, if you gave a concrete example, like what a code gadget would look like in a typical mm -hmm. program. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me show you quickly. Sure, uh, sure. There it is. This one. This is what a code gadget is. You might want to zoom in because I think they oh. may not be able to see it, or, or I'm sure they're going to post this. Uh, but basically, it looks like uh, just like a function call or yes, something yes, yes. similar to that. These are these are just picked up from uh, the code. So so there's there's a C++ code, right? Um, there are certain lines in the code which are just put together. There's not no other. There is some cleanup which is required. That code is also available. Um, the research has worked on it, provided it, but we kind of fine tuned it. So this can also be, uh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, uh, this is essentially CC process code. Yeah. And I, I can't read it, but what I'm looking at, it looks like maybe um, it's a use after free bug or something like one, this. One second. Let me, let me try. Yeah. If it's all right. Or maybe it is a buffer overflow bug. I can't actually read it, but of course it's in it's in VLC player, so it's mm -hmm. a good co code choice because that's horribly vulnerable to everything. Okay. Uh. Yeah. One second, guys. I want to show this. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so uh, whether it's overflow or it's used after free, and I have to read through it. And this is buffer so overflow. Yeah, it looks like this overflow. is buffer overflow, but zero here means that this code uh, is free of vulnerabilities. I can pull up the actual file if, if people are that interested. Um, nope, it's it's fine. Yeah, I think yeah. that was uh, that that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. If like I said, I mean, you're going to be in the hallway later. You can actually yeah. send them the link to the um, right exact commit that maybe yeah. fixes it. Okay. Um, there was another one here that was more generic, mm -hmm. and so I think this is actually a great one for for you. So so needy, um, if you are hacker or if you're not an expert in any kind of data science or machine learning what would you recommend somebody does to get started like what's a good way for them to get started in this um so i when i when i'm teaching my undergrads what i do is just send them a bunch of uh, towards data science links they have just the right level of abstraction and it will really help you get started um so look for towards data science. People have posted a lot of nice, uh, um, you know, step by step, uh, um, you know, approach to everything in data, data science. Literally, I have learned a lot from looking at examples and also on uh, Kegel. If you want to check out, uh, you know, how the uh, the exact, uh, you know, step by step uh, output to um, to to, uh, to the notebooks. My notebooks, you can just go and check out on KGLOS, but I would start with towards data science. Toward data science. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. I mean, just for my edification, right? There's got to be, um, there's got to be uh, applications where this type of discovery, of this vulnerability discovery, is totally um, made. Um, it's useful, right? So there's got to be bug classes in which this type of method that you're doing yes. makes sense. And then there's got to be some that has not proven to be effective yet yes. with this type of, of, of learning. So do, do we know what those are yet? Do we know what those generic bug classes are? Yes. Um, so that is kind of a limitation. And this is not uh, very old work. This was done in 2018. And uh, I, I have mentioned it at a couple of places. This is not my work. Uh, but the researchers didn't provide original code. So, so so some people worked on, you know, inferring what the code will look like. And then uh, people like me looked into that code and, you know, kind of figured out what is missing and uh, make it a bit more accessible. So this is the link. So if, when people are able to see the slides, this is the link to the original work. 
Um, and uh, over there, I, these researchers have admitted they try to work it out with a bunch of other vulnerability uh, classes, but these two were the only ones that uh, they were successful either because of uh, lack of av availability of uh, enough data, which is like, you know, is extremely important. And sometimes it's also lack of understanding of that kind of vulnerability, you know, by the people who are working on it um, and also not being able to see good results. So I mentioned that BLSTM will probably not work on, on other kind of uh, vulnerability classes. So you have to figure out uh, which one works for which. So there is a lot of work left to be done in this space and it's, it's, it's very, very new. Um, so, yeah. Right. And my understanding is, uh, is there, uh, just, just trying to get, get a, uh, um, question and, and this is going to feed into the next question. So mm -hmm. I saw that you used TensorFlow yes. for, um, for the models. Yes. So, uh, Along with that, I see that we had a question that says, once you're done training the model, what is the overhead for running the model? And I would imagine with TensorFlow, it's gotten better. I would have to have imagined. Yes, yes. So what do I say? I have a GPU in my computer. <laughs> Without that, it will, you know, it's a CPU versus GPU. And uh, you, do need, um, you do need a GPU. Otherwise, deep learning is going to suck the life out of your computer. So you do need, just talk, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, you do need GPUs, even, even if it's remote, that's fine. It's sitting on a cloud. Uh, there are plenty of free, you know, short-term um, uh, AWS uh, access available. I think if one is a student, uh, you can get to your student account, your company can provide you uh, for a short period of time, or even they, AWS and Google Cloud can provide, uh, you know, there are ways out, ways out, is what I'm saying. And I, I have, I have, uh, a very new MacBook Pro, which has GPU. So I was able to, so my overhead, uh, so what I saw uh, between when I used to have CPU in my computer only, and now that I both, uh, with GPU, I'm just sitting and looking at my computer and I have no clue how long this, um, the, the training will take. And obviously it also depends on the size of the training, but deep learning, let's just say uh, as a common comment, it will take uh, a lot of time. Uh, because you want the model to uh, understand or uh, to learn is what the training does is to learn as much as possible, uh, which is called uh, fitting um, into what, what has been provided, the data that has been provided. You want a large data set and to work with that, um, you do need uh, uh, you know, a compatible system. Right, right. And with so much open source software today, I mean, I think... Yes. All of GitHub is right is a is you know a good training. Yes, even uh, Kaggle is, uh, has freely available GPU, so you can run your code on on Kaggle platform also. Just upload your own data set, and you you will be able to try out code over there. Right, and then in this model, do you um, always have to train it on bad data or can you start training it on good data or what's the yeah. for somebody that wants to do this by themselves and i know that this is not a data science class at all right so no no, no. i i'm, I'm happy to answer <laughs> these questions also yeah. because yeah. it's more more importantly we need to understand what the model is doing so this is a binary classifier blst and binary classifier means you need you need both type of labeling good which is uh, you know clean data as well as, as, well as vulnerable data but uh, outside of this, there are uh, other deep learning or machine learning approaches which perform clustering uh, through which what we can do is either provide just the, um, the clean data and uh, you can do anomaly detection because you have the ground truth through the clean data and anything outside of that will be anomalous or we can call it uh, vulnerable data. The thing with that is we will not be able to tell what class of data it is. So for that, we need some multi classifiers. Again, when we're doing multiple, multi, multi classification, we do need to know the signature of that vulnerability, which will be captured uh, only if you provide it. Yeah. Uh, wow. Okay. So uh, actually, we had a, a couple of uh, questions in your hallway. And um, so, so Mr. Itel here, <laughs> is asking or is giving a shout out to RPI sec. 
So for those that might even know, right? Uh, yeah, so um, he wanted to know a few things, right? Semantically linked lines of code, what does that mean in practice, right? Uh, semantically, uh, line of code means that... Uh, linked, semantically linked line of code. Yeah, it's like a short function. It's a small program. Just, just, just short. Okay. Yeah, yes. They, they cannot be discontinued or they, they cannot be just lines of code which have nothing to do with one another. I can't just copy. So let's say there are three functions. I can't just copy two lines from one function, two lines from the other, and then just put them together and say this is these are semantically linked. Uh, they, they need to have some continuity. Otherwise, uh, like I said, uh, BLSTM has to have uh, sequential logic that will not uh, be, uh, that won't apply anymore to those lines of codes, which kind of introduces a possibility of uh, introducing human error. Um, and those are, you know, other, uh, th th those are also avenues of, uh, you know, more research. But uh, there are definitely a lot of limitations even with this approach. Okay, and I'm gonna try to reformulate his other question okay. in a way that I would wanna know. Statistically speaking, okay, let's say that you took this code base, which you knew had 10 bugs, right? Right. Does the model find all 10 bugs? Does it find nine bugs? Or so, so with what kind of statistical accuracy, let's say I take a brand new sample size and I say, you know what? Here's a whole new thing, right? That you've never okay. So this is this is our this is the actual analysis mm -hmm. for both known and yeah. unknown. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So you could throw this model at an unknown set of source code, and mm -hmm. you'll have fairly accurate precision there, right? That's right. That's and, right. And the way that we do accuracy is based on known bugs, but there's like this isn't, I would have to assume that there's going to be this very small sliver of code that humans haven't found bugs for yet. And the mm -hmm. machines haven't found bugs for yet either. They definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, that's right. And that's what the whole point behind uh, using these models is that uh, you don't need to know everything in advance because if you do, then, um, well, uh, what's the point of what's the point of these models? But you just train them enough that they they are able to see what a clean code looks like. So it's not just looking at the vulnerable code; it's also looking at the clean code. So so both of these are combined when you when you're forming the model. But the only thing with deep learning is that it's it's a black box. Uh, it's very hard to tell what exactly the model is doing because of the vectorization uh, embeddings. And, uh, and also because of the hidden layers. So it's unfortunate that uh, as much you can explain through machine learning, you are not able to explain through deep learning. Um, but yes, uh, even unknown bugs can be identified, whether they can be tagged or they can be labeled as what type of, um, uh, what type of vulnerability they are, that is still work in progress. Yeah, yeah. so I guess, um... okay. I guess we'll wrap it up with this one last question that I have, what's next? Like, what is the next area that you're like, hmm, this might be interesting? Yeah, so I have to admit, uh, this was a very interesting topic even for me to explore. Um, and uh, I have recently started work in, uh, you know, first of all, just understanding what are the limitations of this? You know, instead of expanding, uh, what more can we do? What are the limitations of this approach? And... Um, uh, once we have understood the limitations, we can play along with them. Uh, obviously, identifying so so, the, so there are several avenues, but being able to understand multiple vulnerabilities is uh, is is uh, I think a, a sensible next step. Okay. All right, Nidhi. I I I really was jazzed when I uh, when I saw the presentation. So I really thank you for. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, actually, I have to send. Don't don't go anywhere. But I have to send this back to Emily so she can bring up the SANS eval. So for those okay. that really enjoyed uh, ta seeing this research and um, are interested in this, this is like this was like one of the talks that I was like, yes, you gotta have something like this that I I'm really interested in. So for those that had all the questions and there was tons of questions in this talk, if you're really into this data science stuff. Um, 
by all means, let's, uh, Emily, are you there? Are you, can you grab, uh, share your screen? I want to make sure. Uh, you yep. I'm working on it. Sorry about yeah. that. And it is in all the Slack channels right now as well. Um, awesome. awesome. Right on. So sorry, I've got a, just the, sh the slide shuffle going on, but I will try yeah. to get to that momentarily. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to make sure that you all uh, that enjoyed the talk, you go fill out the evals for, for Needy. You know, for me, if I'm an advocate, I'd like to see her come back and do more talks. And this is a surefire way to do mm -hmm. that. And, uh, you know, I, I can't wait to see more research around this because yes. You know, we find bugs, but then you already find bugs. You know, there's there's some That's stuff cute. that I think machine yes. learning has yet to uncover. So, um, yeah. this is actually a pretty interesting uh, topic. So, thank you, Needy, uh, thank and you. she'll be in her hallway yeah. answering any other questions for the next X um, amount of time. I'm okay. not sure. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thirty minutes at least, something okay. like that. Uh, and I'm sure if she, you know, she'll hang around if she can longer. Yeah. And so I appreciate it, and um, thank you so much for this. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending.